Hello and welcome to Confetti Industry Week. Welcome to your session with Wojciech Szelinski, who will be talking to you about how to develop and build on your career and to develop and build your portfolio for the video games industry. Please use the chat function to ask questions and we'll aim to answer as many as we can. So we do hope you'll enjoy today's session and a massive, massive thank you for Wojciech for taking the time to join us today on our 15th Confetti Industry Week. Now, don't forget, you can still book upcoming events uh, by going to iw.confetti.ac.uk and make sure that you're using your Confetti and NTU email addresses. As part of Industry Week, we are running a competition where you can win some pretty cool prizes. Uh, all you have to do is tag us on Twitter or Instagram using hashtag IW21 and share your experiences that you've had throughout the week. Uh, so, without further ado, Wojciech, it's really good to meet you and see you again. Uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. I hope that you can hear me right now. Is that everything all right? Okay, so let's start our presentation. Okay. Right, so hello everyone. It's really a pleasure to be on Confetti Industry Week this year and shame that we cannot uh, do it in person due to COVID uh, restrictions, but I hope you will enjoy it, enjoy it anyway. Uh, before we jump into my presentation about building your career and developing your portfolio, I would like to briefly introduce myself. For you who are struggling with a pronunciation of my name, my name is Wojciech Halinski, and currently I'm environment artist at CD Project Vets with nearly 10 years of um, experience in industry and six years of professional industry experience, as same as indie game development and modding backgrounds. Um, so I started my 3D career around 10 years ago by making modifications for old RPG games like The Elder Scrolls, for example. And firstly, I, because of the community, like modding community, I've learned how to change the, the textures. I started with like really simple color manipulation for, I don't know, armors or some background textures. And after a couple of years in this in this uh, uh, community, I joined a few indie developers uh, who helped me develop my skills even further. Um, there was there was um, a big a big thing in my life when I joined uh, Game Artisan Don't OIG a discussion board when where artists could share their own models and it helped me to develop my 3D modeling skills. I think uh, this, this discussion board doesn't exist anymore. And, um, you know, most of the indie projects I participated in, they never been released or they've been like big fiasco, but it was still a valuable lesson for me. Um, another big step for me was working as an outsourcer uh, for games like Farming Simulator and a few other mobile games. And after two years, um, after two years in this company, I decided to move forward and move to UK to study CGMA at Derby Uni. And on the first year, I managed to get a job in professional industry in Bullcat Interactive Studio. Uh, when we released Battalion 1944, uh, I moved back to Poland to work on Cyberpunk in a CD Projekt Red. So here you have some games I worked on. As mentioned before, Farming Simulator, when I was responsible for creating farming machines. Um, the cool thing about this was um, all the machines were licensed, so we had the cut files from, uh, from the, the producers. And the only thing we, we had to do is just make the transition from very heavy models to, to the game ready assets. Um, another game I worked on was uh, Battalion 1944. I was an environment artist there. Uh, I did props, shaders, uh, lighting, uh, as same as uh, some uh, some buildings, I was responsible for designing them, as same as some set dressing on the, on the level. I'm and, sorry to stop you there, uh, Wojciech. Yep. I can't see a presentation, mate. You can't see the presentation? Mm -mm. Oh, damn. Yeah, let me share my screen then. Good to know that you can't, can't see that. Thanks, Wojciech. Um, 
where's the shares? Where's the sharing thing? Uh, shares being. How about that? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. And sorry for issue. No problem. Let me just open it once again. There you go. And as I mentioned before, uh, now I'm working on Cyberpunk. So here you have some example of uh, my works. This is uh, this is the Max Payne environment I did for at University of Derby for one of my uh, one of my uh, module. Here you have the BB-8 drone, completely made in Substance Designer. A few more Substance Designer. Uh, texture I created, and the recent recent work from from Cyberpunk. So, how to start your your career? So, it might be quite trivial, but you have to make the choice, and you have to ask yourself, like, what do I like to do in my career? What do I want to do in my life? And then just do it. It's that simple and that hard at the same time. Uh, there are multiple 3D industries you can pick from, like game dev, VFX, or films, and each of them have different limitations, different rules that you have to follow. And for example, you cannot make really smooth transition from making the visualization for architecture and do the game dev at the same time because of different amount of triangles, different texture techniques, and so on. And because you're starting your career, I would recommend to you to give yourself a bit of time uh, for experimenting and do not limit yourself. Uh, try different stuff from, you know, environment modeling, sculpting the characters, uh, lighting, or even particle effects. And after a couple months, you you should get enough data to analyze and see where you made the biggest uh, the biggest progress. Um, try to have like realistic goals, and you know do not expect your first model models or textures will have AAA quality. Uh, you have to be really honest with you, and uh, do not expect too much at the beginning, as I said. So when I was at university, I met a lot of people who actually struggled with this this first point, with this first question. Uh, they enrolled on university because they liked games. Um, you know, uh, they they wanted to make some graphics or uh, some animations. But the problem was, uh, you know, they they never found the um the specializations they want to focus on they were like they, they try to be like really like generalist and um you know some of them they they drop off the course because they they expected that university will will teach uh, everything for them and to be fair uh, just to let you know your school or like further universities if you if you plan to go um in the future is there to show you the way? Is there is there to show you the path you should you should follow? So, um, you know, sometimes you might be annoyed because hey, they didn't teach me anything here. But it's literally impossible to uh, to teach three D modeling, for example, with really limited uh, time constraints. So um, all the tasks you're getting right now in your school, like even very simple ones are there to show you uh, which things you might enjoy in the future. So uh, even if you're making simple prop, maybe you'll fall in love in that uh, specialization. So then you will be much easier for you to, to follow it and to basically extend your knowledge in this matter. Um, so that's why it's super important to make choice right now, to try different things, do not limit yourself and, and basically move forward. Okay, another thing is your dream job. So 
finding your dream studio might definitely help you with making decisions like what you want to do. You know, each studio has a different, different style and specialized specialize in different games. So for example, if you like games for, from Blizzard or Riot Games, you know, they have very special special style in the, in, in the, in the games. You know, they're making mostly stylized stuff. So if you like these kind of genre, maybe that's the way of, of doing your, your graphic later for example if you like i don't know witcher which is more realistic story driven games uh, probably you should you should do something you should do something similar it's not about you know trying to copy something from from day games but definitely you might get more attention from your from your dream studios or at least get um get the offer from the studio that specializes in very similar genre um, if you want to work in specific studio, maybe it's a good thing to try to recreate something from day, day games. You know, it can be prop, it can be environment, diorama or character. Uh, but the thing is, you have to try to be original and put a lot of soul into that. Because if you just copy stuff, uh, there's, there's pretty much not enough effort for most of the recruiters or people in the studio. Um, so, you know, try to change thing, things, give a personal touch. Um, so in my case, um, you know, I worked on my Mac, oh, sorry, my Max Payne uh, environment, which, um, sorry, uh, which basically uh, was my, my inspiration. Uh, so I was big, like big fan of Max Payne game and Vermindy Entertainment Studio. So I decided, hey, uh, maybe it's a good idea to give a shot and try to recreate one of my my favorite games. Um, so it helped me to make me decision to to become environment artist. It definitely revealed a lot of mistakes and helped me to avoid them later. And you know, just because. I've been noticed by, you know, some employees of Remedy Entertainment or different media. Um, it went viral and gave me enough attention to, to get the job offers from different studios. So, uh, you know, even one good, um, good artwork in your portfolio can definitely help you to, to get a job in industry. So, um, so definitely I, I would focus on on your dream job and maybe maybe you know it worked in my case uh, it doesn't have to work in your case but it's definitely worth to uh to to give a shot and on, try on that note watch uh boy check what would you say the best media platform is to post game art replicas for companies to see well, definitely ArtStation. I think it's the largest media right now. Uh, the, there are a couple of Facebook groups that you can post on like 10,000 10, hours or uh, 80 level. Um, you know, there, there's a plenty, you know, there's a lot of communities nowadays. So it's, I think it's worth it to post it, to post it pretty much everywhere. Same as, you know, your LinkedIn profile, your Facebook, maybe if you have Instagram, you know, uh, nowadays, Pretty much everyone can uh, can recruit it. Uh, you know, everyone can see your work, no matter where it is. Uh, so, so probably you know, posted posted like everywhere, like on relevant groups, like ten thousand hours, eighty level, some Discord groups, uh, art station, definitely. Thank you. Okay. So another important thing uh, when when we're talking about your career is planning. Like planning is crucial uh, because when you want to make like one project, you might feel overwhelmed by the size of it at the beginning. So try to use uh, planning apps and roughly estimate your every milestone. Use Trello, for example, set priority for, for every task. And it will help you to develop like estimating skill, which is like super important in your career later on. Like every recruiter will, um, will definitely ask you, how do you feel about crunching? How do you feel about estimating your own work? Are you, are you all right with working with producers who are mostly responsible for you know, dealing with the tasks? And assigning them for you, uh, so um, you know, break down your project into manageable pieces, into pieces that you can chew. 
uh, and you know, creating environments or any other form of, of art is really iterative process and do not get disappointed and do not have high hopes at the beginning. Uh, you know, your project, when you start your project and you start with, with like some great boxing, obviously not going to look awesome, but at least, at least it gives you like solid foundation for, uh, for your project later on. It would be much easier if you plan it, if you break it down into pieces. Uh, if you be, you know, realistic with your estimates, with if you're going to be honest with yourself, and you know, sometimes you don't have to go for really big projects to make good impression on the recruiters and get the offer. Sometimes less is definitely more. So, uh, how does it work in in the practice? So basically, as I said before, I plan to make my Max Payne uh, environment based on the game and some real photographs. So uh, start with the idea, you know, and do your research, make sure that you want to do something. But you have to clear, you have to keep your, your head really clear. Do not overhype yourself that, yes, I'm going to do this and message like 10, 20 people that, hey, I'm starting new projects. How exciting it is. Like, firstly, do your work first and, and then eventually message your friends, you know, maybe, uh, maybe they'll help you with, with some bits later on. Do not be scared of the of the scope of the project. Uh, it will be much easier if you break it down into smaller chunks, as I mentioned before. And of course, um, you know when you do like remaster of uh, of the environment from your your favorite game or character or anything else. Uh, you have to make sure that you have enough references from real words and from your game also. In the case of old games, uh, just uh, keep in mind that back in the days, they had to simplify a lot of things. Um, you know, they didn't have enough budget to express themselves. So it will be nice if you do that, um, that personal touch to the environments and add something from yourself. Definitely, it will help you later on you know, because you will show yourself as a really creative person. Um, you know, plan your thing, break down into, into pieces, start with the, with the biggest pieces, walls, pillars, flows, et cetera. So I break down my, my environment into pieces. You know, I use Trello to do that. I set my, my milestones, like uh, all of these tabs where my milestones, depends on your, on your pipeline, you can, you can break it down even into into more more tabs like if you do high quality low poly you can you can add it here you know and trust me it will be like super satisfying to to move the move the task from i don't know in progress into done so it will give you another boost uh, another boost of satisfaction so it's like extremely important all of the tasks had the uh, the estimates like the the, the dates to to finish it uh, also, the the priority, like the green uh, green tabs, were pretty much like small props, something I use for for decoration. Uh, you know, uh, yellow um, yellow uh, tab was something more important, and the red one was something crucial for the environment, like the biggest pieces. So, as I said before, start with something really simple. We can do the blockouts in Maya Max or whatever three uh, D software you're using. Uh, break down, uh, like you don't have to break down uh, this environment into pieces yet. Try to work on the scale, on the, the, the feeling of the environment first, and then eventually you can jump into, into another, uh, another process. So at this stage, you can also work on the mood of the scene. So I plan to do something in between of Max Payne, movie and Matrix. So I try to, you know, tint the light slightly, put some, put some lighting. Um, you know, I started to to add more and more pieces, like some pillars, maybe some uh, placeholder of lamps. You know, I place some spotlights. You know, just to just to try to uh, extend my block out a little bit. And it's definitely helpful, uh, you know, in the future when when you're just gonna pretty much swap the the meshes from, from the blockouts into like thread the pieces. So here's another another iteration of the blockout. You know, I started to add some 
uh, some taping on the door, like pillars, um, you know, different, uh, different modules of the wall to make more variation, some simple particle effects and, and stuff like that. And, you know, at this point, obviously, you don't have to create your own textures. You can use something from, uh, uh, in this case, Unreal Engine 4 library. You can just tile it as, as much as you want. You can just tint it to, to have, like, the proper, proper color uh, from, your, from your reference. And, uh, you know, you don't have to have, like, really advanced materials. It's mostly about to block out your scene, block out the colors. And... Um, my advice is every time you do the blockouts, even of, uh, you know, simple props or something like that, um, you can always apply the, the colors and break the, like, block out the materials also. It will help you to imagine how the, how the asset will look like uh, when, you, when you finish it. So you basically block out not only the shape of the model, but also the, the textures. And once you finish the, the block out, you can move forward and try, uh, you know, to split the uh, the block out into pieces. So you can eventually have more variation. You can uh, build, you can extend your environment. You can build more things, more rooms, and, and stuff like that with the modules. Like I think modularity and environments, especially, are, are the crucial. It's something that you definitely have to have to learn how to do, how to snap the modules. Like you need to make sure that all of them are based on the grid. So it will be much easier to snap it in the engine and so on. Also working with, um, you know, UVs is really important because, you know, you have to make sure that all the, um, all your modules are pretty much uh, tieable and you don't have any visible seams. And, and as I said, because, you know, they had a lot of limitations back in the day, so it's really important to have, like, good library of the references. So in this case, I use textures.com to find, like, um, you know, pictures that might represent the, the textures from the game. It, it gave me enough data, you know, to recreate them later in the Substance Designer. So it's, it's really important to, to have, like, reference pretty much for, for everything, like for the textures, for the, for the shapes. And, and, and so on. Are these references something that you would go out and get yourself or do you have some good websites? Uh, basically, I think Google and Pinterest is, is way to go. You have to just you have to just learn how to how to use it, how to you know use the keywords to find what you want to what you want to find. But basically, I think Pinterest is is the most powerful tool right now. You can basically find anything you want um, with the the references from the game. Also, you can. You can, you can basically play your favorite game or the game you want to recreate or remaster, right? And take enough screenshot of pretty much everything, like every single pebble, uh, like wall, a pillar, whatever you like to do, just take a bunch of screenshots from every side and you'll get, you'll get enough, uh, enough information to recreate it later. And as I said, creating environments is really iterative process. So uh, you'll probably end up on really messy scenes. So try to be organized as much as possible. Uh, when you you know put the uh, the modules together, you will find out that hey, uh, it's it's getting somewhere. So you'll probably get more and more ideas how to make it in more interesting. So probably the decal decals and additional lighting is is the way to go. Like small details, you know, uh, creating environments is also like uh, like a telling a story. You know, you can include a lot of nice Easter eggs. You can uh, include the, the history, you know. Uh, like in this case, you know, probably someone just kicked that, that litter over there. So uh, small things that, that definitely make the, make the difference. When you're making and developing modular assets, do you typically work forwards to backwards? Um, so, for example, you build the scene up or do you break the scene apart in planning? So, um, usually I have two, uh, two iterative processes. Like, first of all, I like to uh, kind of concept the whole thing as a one piece, you know, to, to feel the scale. Uh, to get the, the right feeling of the scene. And when, I'm, when I feel that, hey, uh, it's getting somewhere, it's like the point 
uh, you know, uh, that I need to uh, take the step back and probably use that concept I created earlier to, to break down things into pieces or try to recreate it with the, the modular pieces I made from the scratch. But, you know, um, creating blockouts is like making the sketch. So uh, you can always throw uh, throw away one piece and you won't feel feel bad about it because um, you know it's quite simple you use primitive primitive meshes so you you won't feel disappointed or you won't feel that you wasted a lot of time on creating thing because it's, it's basically work, working with you know gray boxes and cylinders so probably uh you know you can you can create that uh, 3d concept by using uh bsp for example in unreal engine 4 just make sure that you set the the right scale um and and then you can build whatever you want and eventually just just refine it later yes thank you you talked about how important uv mapping was and texturing indeed uh, is 2D texture artists a thing in the industry anymore? Is this a role that's been combined into a, you know, the responsibilities of a 3D mm -hmm. artist? Uh, so it depends on the scale of the studio. So if you, if you go to big AAA studios, probably they have a position like a texturing, a texture artist for sure, because most of the specialization they have their own position like vehicle artists, like weapon artists and so on and so on. When it comes to, to smaller studios, probably you're more like a generalist. So you need to know how to model, you need to know how to texture UV map and stuff like that. And also texturing, uh, texture artists is like a bit different nowadays, because of the procedural texturing stuff, so it's worth to know like some uh, some recent uh, recent tech and definitely do your research about it. Because nowadays it's not only about making the textures; it's also um, the knowledge about the optimization, the graphs, and, and substance designer, for example, to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Okay, thank you. So <clears throat> another thing is sorry, I need to sit. Another thing is like be open for feedback and constructive criticism. You know, not every feedback uh, you will hear it will be nice. So sometimes it won't help you, but at least you'll get fresh look on your work. When you work on something for for many hours, you'll basically be a, a bit tired of it, and you won't notice any any mistakes you made um, by the time. So it's really important to ask someone from feedback to get that fresh look, and um, and basically the feedback is only to to help you to make your work better. Um, you know, remember feedback is about your work as not about you as an artist. So try to not get it uh, personally, especially when you work in a big studio, like uh, taking the, the feedback or giving the feedback is really important skill because it shows you that you're professional. Um, you know, do, do not take it personally, even if it sounds harsh, if it's like just food or something like that, you can you can ignore it. But, you know, some artists, they uh, they basically don't care about, uh, you know, some interpersonal skills. They, they just want to give you give you the feedback, give you the answer, even if it even if it sounds really harsh. I remember I posted some some of my work on the stream. On the, on the Twitch for the for the artist I followed, and basically I when you know when he when he gave me the feedback I, I felt really bad about it, but after after I don't know ten minutes I started to realize that hey this guy was right you know he pointed a lot of good stuff, um, so you know it will it will always uh, help you to to become stronger. And you can always ask people who are not in the industry because everyone can notice something different, you know, especially if you make the characters for the games, you know, everyone can see the reflection in the mirror so they can point out that there's something wrong with your character, there's something wrong with your proportions or the placement of the, of the elements. So even uh, feedback from uh, people who are not in the, in the, in the, in the industry, it's, it's still valuable feedback. So be really open for that. Uh, set your goals and challenge yourself. Uh, so basically there's nothing wrong to jump into, into the deep water uh, because even if something will be extremely difficult to you at the beginning, 
you'll get enough information at the end of the project. You you can you know write down every mistake you made uh, you made uh, in the in the process of creation of this of this project, like a post mortem, and then it will help you to you know avoid these mistakes later on. Uh, it's it's really important to be like ambitious and. Uh, uh, in the industry, you know, everyone will definitely notice that. Every, everyone will give you a credit for it that your ambition, that you're trying to do something different, you know, because you have like thousands and thousands of artists who create like AK-47 by Thor or Barrel and put it to to their portfolio, or they following the the tutorials and then they posting it into uh, into their portfolio. So it pretty much looks the same. And your goal is to be like different to show off yourself uh, so if you you know there's nothing wrong with creating simple props for your portfolio but when you do it try to give it a, a little twist try to be creative if you if you create barrel you know do like a like a crazy barrel you know something crazy and it will it will definitely that will be definitely something that that impress recruiters later on they they will just spot you uh, among a lot of you know uh, simple barrels simple simple props on the on the art station for example and it will also show that um, you can improvise which is like really important when you work in a studio when you have the issue you don't have a time and you have to find a solution as fast as possible so it will also show that you know you have plenty ideas. You uh, you um, you definitely will be a good player in the team. So you know, set your goals, challenge yourself, always do something something more and more difficult for yourself. Um, so if you if you created a small diorama first, like firstly, secondly, do another environment, but try to be more creative. Try to. Uh, extend the scale of it, extend the, the scale of the project. Uh, keep yourself focused. So motivation in industry is like key. It's it's hard uh, to, to keep yourself focused when you do like really big projects. So uh, that's why I mentioned before that, uh, you know, uh, keeping everything organized and moving that tab from in progress into done is something that will give you a motivation boost. It will keep you focused. So uh, try to stick to your estimates, uh, be very strict with yourself. So if you plan that, hey, I'm gonna work for four hours today, just do it. Um, don't make uh, stupid excuses because you know sometimes it's, it's good to sacrifice going out uh, to close your milestone, especially nowadays with COVID restrictions, you pretty much sit all day at home so you can you can focus on building your career. And again, uh, again, be honest, if you said that I'll close this task today, make everything to, to do it, you know, stick to your plan. However, you know, sometimes it, it's good to, to take a small break uh, to, to balance your social life, like work and social life. And you know, uh, sometimes you will definitely need it to, to go out, to meet your friends, uh, watch a movie. But uh, you know, try to balance it. Do not uh, overuse. Uh, you know, taking taking a break uh, to to have like a good excuse of not working on your project. Like stick to your plan and always finish your project. Um, that's the thing I always advise to my uh, to my students when I do the mentorship for them. So uh, even if it's hard to you, uh, even if you feel uh, demotivated, dismotivated and, and, and uh, stuff like that, always try to finish the projects no matter what. Even if you don't feel that it will be good, you'll get enough, you'll get a lot of information from it. You'll get a lot of knowledge from it. Uh, you will learn, and you will, you'll find out the mistakes you've made and the mistakes that you need to avoid in the future. So no matter what, finish your projects and do not start another project before you, you finish the first one. Other than the really good advice of, you know, just taking short breaks and not too often. Um, if you were to lose motivation during a project, what, what things do you do to pick yourself back up? So usually I take uh, like like longer break, but it's it's kind of risky because if you do the project for months and months, it will be much harder to come back to it. 
so usually I just I just go out, try to try to relax, try to play a game or watch a movie, and maybe something you know the movie that is is similar to the genre of the project that you're going. So it it might give you another inspiration boost. You know, you might easily come back to your project and and uh, say to yourself that hey, I really want to finish it right now. Sometimes it's about you know listening to the soundtrack from the game you 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 recreating. Because I remember when I created my Max Payne scene, I listened to the to the soundtrack from Max Payne, and it definitely helped me to you know. I got that feeling that hey, I'm in Remedy Entertainment right now, and I'm creating Max Payne One. So it it, it was it was kind of funny, but uh, it worked in my case. So maybe maybe give it a try. So um, another thing in your career a career is definitely to to find your community. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, you know there's there's plenty of websites that you can uh, you can post your work and get a feedback. Basically, web websites like ArtStation or Polycans, um, you know, it has they, they have a lot of uh, references. They have a lot of resources that you can use when you stick with stuck with something. Like uh, you don't know how to bake normal maps, bam! You can just Google it. There's like plenty of articles about like how to bake the normal maps. Uh, so also you can you can post your your stuff over there. You can get the feedback from. Uh, from people and you know just because um, you know there's a lot of people like you who start their career who uh, you know try to do their the first models you know uh, no one going to be uh, judgmental uh, you know there's a lot of beginners on art station on polycant and stuff like that and you share basically the same the same issues the same problem problems so once someone find the, the solution for for one problem uh, they can they can share it with you and also if you join like for example some uh you know discord discord chats and if you will post some some work together there you know to, to exchange, ex exchange the knowledge or, or something like that uh, you will definitely feel that it's kind of kind of competition and it will give you another motivation boost it will try to uh, keep you focused. Um, you will try to be better than them. So uh, definitely, it's worth to join like Discord chats or or some Facebook groups and and post uh, regularly. So uh, another like this is the second part of my presentation about like how to how to build your portfolio. So. Uh, your portfolio will be based on your career choice. Uh, try to be, try to not be generalist and try to match portfolio with your specialization. So, for example, if you if you want to be texture artist, just you know post as many textures as possible. Do not mix and match. Like, for example, in the meantime, you can you can make uh, you can follow the tutorial about I don't know making a knife or something like that. But it, it's probably not worth it to, to post it to your portfolio if you consider yourself as a texture artist. Obviously, you can you can post the the model with uh, with some nice texturing, and it will definitely show off your skills. But you know, text, uh, texture artist is mostly about uh, you know creating uh, some trim sheet textures or tileable textures. So try to match it to your uh, to your specialization. If you want to be an environment artist. You know, put the environments or dioramas or props. You know, it will definitely help the recruiters to describe you as a as an artist. Um, so here we have some some examples. Oops, not yet. Uh, okay. But be a specialist, not a generalist, as I mentioned before. You know, being being generalist isn't something bad, but try to focus on one thing and then jump to another to masterize it. You can always change your specialization later on, but you know, it's all about to try to not waste your time. Um, you know, it, it's good to know like many things like animation, even if you're an environment artist, because it, it shows that. You really care that you have like basic knowledge, and you can eventually help with solving the, the simple issues. And you know, most of the 
of the studios, as I mentioned before at the beginning of this presentation, most of the big studios, they're looking for specialists. Uh, of the uh, you know for the professionals in their the specialization so uh it it's probably worth to check the latest offers uh, in the internet you know and you'll find out that most of the time they're looking for environment artists for the prop artists vehicle artists weapon artists and so on um in smaller studios however usually you're one man army and you need to know more than just modeling you need to know how to make the basic shaders, you need to know how to place these models on the level and create a nice composition. You need to know how to how to make lighting and so on. So there's nothing wrong with working in a small studio. I would even say it's better to start with a smaller studio rather than to jump into, uh, into a triple A company straight away because uh, you know you might be shocked. You might be shocked at the at the beginning. In a smaller studios, you are responsible pretty much from for the whole process, from blockout to game ready model for lighting, shading, and stuff like that. And you have yeah, you have a lot of on your shoulders, but at the same time, it gives you another opportunity to find out what you want to do, um, what you want to do in your life, what you want to uh, do as an artist, and also it it, it gives you like you know, extra boost to your knowledge because you have like really wide knowledge. Uh, so if you decide to, to go to bigger studios, uh, definitely anything, like nothing will will surprise you so much. And <clears throat> in, uh, in the bigger studios, however, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's really nice to work on big titles. However, you know, you make the model and then you have to pass it to someone for example, animator or bigger. So uh, sometimes I, I felt really sad that I cannot finish everything everything here and I had to pass it to someone else. I had to share my um, my artwork with someone else and then credit it on the, credit uh, that person on, on my in my portfolio. Uh, so so definitely it's worth to, to check uh, different studios like different size studio. Like probably uh, it's even you know easier for you as the beginner to join um, join smaller studios first and then eventually go higher and higher. That sorry, that's pretty much what happened in, in my career when I started from uh, you know making modifications from the game. Then I jumped into some indie developers. Then uh, I work as an outsourcer from outsourcers to small studio and from small studio to like big AAA company. As time is limited when creating portfolios, do you think it's wiser to have um, a larger portfolio with more projects or a more refined, uh, specialized portfolio with smaller projects? So I would say it's, it's better, you know, as I mentioned before, um, sometimes less is more. So do not put everything in your portfolio. Try to do just the outstanding work. Obviously, you can do something else in the meantime, but it's really important to, to post just the strongest uh, strongest pieces in your portfolio. You know, uh, there are a lot of people that they have like hundreds or, uh, or even thousands like entries in their portfolio, but you know, sometimes it's just not worth it. Sometimes they are people that they're living from for, for making like uh, entries in their portfolio because they have so many followers on their, their social media. So in, in our case, I would probably focus on smaller pieces, um, you know, really refined projects uh, so it can show off your, your real skill. Uh, so it's something really really connected to it. It's like working on your presentation because, for example, if you have average looking you looking model, you can still save it with a good presentation in your portfolio. You know that you you present it in a professional way. So you have to be really creative uh, here. Uh, even if you publish a simple prop, even if you um, if you publish something that you create it in one day or something, but it looks decent enough to publish it. It's still worth to, to take another day to work on the presentation, to refine your backgrounds, to refine the, um, to, to crop the images correctly, you know, to make a nice composition of them. And you can also use references for that. You can uh, use, you know, movies uh, as a reference, like a source of inspiration and so on. 
So in my case, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of Star Wars. However, you know, this uh, this drone, it was like super interesting to recreate with Substance Designer and Tessellation and Displacement Map. So when I find out that, hey, I want to do that drone, I also started to look for the inspiration for my presentation of, uh, of this drone. So I find out some screenshots or concept art from Star Wars Battlefront, Battlefront 2. And I use it as as the inspiration for for my my presentation. You know, obviously it's it's really important to credit people that you're using day day artwork for uh, as an inspiration. But you know, in most of the cases, it, it really works. It show off that you know uh, you can you can be creative here. Right? If in, if you if you try to copy some something from internet, but because you're copying like this. Uh, this uh, way of presenting your work um, you, you can also learn how to light up like light make a lighting on your scene uh, how to work on the composition and, and stuff uh, stuff like that uh, and here was another another example when I just took a screenshot uh, from the movie and try to recreate it in Marmoset. you know uh, you know I download some some texture from from Megascan to create the sand I created like you know simple billboards with like picture of the man you know and blur the whole thing and also like really simple building in the background and I think that show off that you know you really pay attention to the details and it will be definitely beneficial for you. Uh, for you as an artist, as I as I mentioned before, even if you're trying to uh, get inspiration from from your reference, I'm pretty sure you can learn a lot of stuff in the meantime as well, because you learn how to uh, how to, how to do the post processing, how to uh, place stuff on your scene, and so on, so on. So it's it's really important uh, to to learn that skill, and also to have the the good source of of references. It's a really beautiful piece and kind of on this note of presenting your work, uh, a lot of our students know we have to annotate our work through and through to make sure that we're justifying and we're seeing what, we, uh, seeing what we're making and how we're doing it. Is this something you should do on your portfolio or do you think the artwork should speak for itself? I believe artwork should speak uh, for, for itself. So uh, basically if you have a good, um, good piece of art, uh, you don't have to do much, you know. Uh, however, with a good presentation, you can definitely boost that quality. Uh, you can get, you know, more likes, more shares, because it will definitely look better. Um, you know, if you look at the games, especially nowadays, most of the props in the environment or the characters are pretty average. You know, when you when you take the random piece from the scene, right? Due to limitations, due to budget budgets. You know, it's usually usually looks quite average, but when you add the good lighting, the good composition, the whole thing look uh, look really nice. And the same thing applies to to making the presentation uh, in your portfolio. With a good lighting, good presentation, you can definitely boost the quality of the things you made. Um, and here's another example of uh, my presentation. So I created just simple brick textures, something that you can find hundreds and hundreds on ArtStation. But you know, I decided to give a little uh, a little twist to it and make simple animation and uh, marmoset with some you know sound effects to to basically get the attention to show off that you know I'm I'm trying to do something else that most of the people. And also, it's super important when you publish your artwork on the, on the art station or, or different media to show off all the technical aspects of, of your artwork. So all the uh, you know wireframes should be there, you know, to show off that hey, 
you know how to optimize your models, that you know how to pack the UV. So try to provide as many important information for potential recruiter as, as possible. You can, um, you know, include information like trice count, the, the resolution of your maps, and, you know, in case that you're afraid of uh, stealing your art book, you can always include like simple watermark or something. Um, there's also option to include Marmoset scene viewer to your presentation. However, I've heard that it's quite easy to steal your model. And I've seen a couple of times that a couple, couple of my models on some dodgy, dodgy websites that pretty much someone just downloaded it and tried to make a dollar on it. So be careful with that, uh, that also. And maybe when you include something like Marmoset scene viewer on your portfolio, try to secure it somehow with uh, watermarks or, um, or, or stuff like that, basically. But put your strongest works first. So as I mentioned a couple of times, uh, sometimes less is more. So create uh, you know, interesting thumbnail for your strongest piece and put it to the top of the, of the portfolio. Do not publish everything. You know, sometimes it's worth, worth to, um, to publish less, to, to do the artwork just for yourself to, uh, to make sure that um, you're progressing. But uh, you know, as, as we talked before, it's, it's really worth to, to post only strongest work because on every single recrutation uh, interview, on every interview with recruiters, they will ask you, what's your strongest point uh, in your portfolio? What's your weakest point? So it's, it's, uh, it's better to have as, um, not as many weak, weak artworks on your portfolio um, as, as possible. So uh, try to promote your strongest, uh, strongest work by putting it first. And, and basically, basically that's it. Uh, you have to you have to be uh, really creative. You have to um, you have to be really critical about your work as well. So if you feel that hey, um, it's not good enough for my portfolio, do not publish it because you can make more mess than uh, than good things. Would you have a specialized portfolio for? You know that one that is suited to a particular company would you use the same art styles as well as adding your own flourishes to that artwork to apply for a specific studio or would you just have a generic blanket portfolio so um as i mentioned before you can find your dream studio that you want to work with and try to do something similar to today games or day style there's nothing wrong about it but tr try to not build your your whole brand your whole portfolio on you know copying something from from other games you have to be you have to be creative you have to uh, show off that uh, you you can't just uh, just copy but also you can you can create your own artwork you know you can do your own research and um and you know, uh, create your own art style as well. So when it comes to, to the portfolio, uh, you know, I would suggest to, to be really, uh, really specific. Do not try to be generalist uh, unless you want to work in smaller studios, um, you know, because it's, as I mentioned, uh, you have to be generalist there. But usually you don't have enough time to masterize everything. You cannot be, really good character artist and at the same time creates the uh, outstanding environment. So I would suggest to, uh, to you know, uh, to focus on one thing. I remember, you know, Sean, you might remember that uh, how many times uh, we had the presentations and people wanted to do like pretty much everything, like characters, like environments, and it just doesn't work. So you have to you have to just finish on focus on one thing and, and finish it. And I'm pretty sure it would be it will be more beneficial for you because you'll you'll make like a really good quality of of art instead of doing really average one. So um, going back to, to my presentation, you have to build your brand. So once you have your art station or different media, try to connect to uh, each other. Uh, try to connect them to each other, you know, try to connect your art station to 
I don't know, your Facebook or LinkedIn, post stuff on your LinkedIn. Maybe you can uh, create Instagram and post, you know, some work in progress uh, pictures and slowly build your brands to have more connections and more recognition in, in the industry. Because, you know, once you create enough art, like good art, people will start to to remember your name, basically. And, um, you know, once you create something that when will go viral, people will definitely recognize you and, you know, pass the information about you to some recruiters. Hey, there's a guy who's creating like really, really good environments. So maybe it's uh, worth to, to hire him. And that's it. Thank you for listening. If you have uh, any questions, uh, that's the right time to to do all right well thank you very much for that boy uh question one what's the project that you've enjoyed working on the most and which one has been the trickiest so i think both of the question apply to cyberpunk because uh you know it was one of the biggest projects so far uh in my career uh it was tricky because it was like a huge open world game so you know we couldn't add a lot of triangles we had we were limited by the by the budget um, of the of the props so you can you had to use a lot of uh, a lot of tricks to you know squeeze everything into into that budget and uh, I really enjoyed it you know because um, I worked with so many talented people and we could share the knowledge for uh, between each other so that was that was definitely the project I enjoyed the most nice um here's another one uh with a team of about five or ten people how long do you think it would take to create a game demo well of course depends on the on the scope of the game like when we're talking about mobile games and let's say if we're talking about five people who are experienced in the creating uh, creating games probably not longer than six seven months i would say i think it's reasonable uh, maybe less, but it's always worth to add that additional month or, or two to have that, um, you know, that that's, uh, safe, uh, safe time that they can use for fixing bugs or, or something like that, but probably not, not too long. And also, I want to mention that, you know, when you want to develop your first game or if you have to develop the, uh, the game for your module at your school, probably I would, I would go simple, you know. Do like the most simple, trivial game that you can find, you know, it will definitely help you to develop your skills. And uh, remember that you have limited time, especially on university. You cannot make AAA games in 12, 12, week, 12 weeks, for example. So probably like a five months, I would say, depends on the experience of the, of the developers. Okay, nice. So. Mr. Holt asks, what do you have to think about when you're reducing the polygons in a model? What's your mindset? So, so basically, it depends on your pipeline. Um, if you're using, for example, normal maps baked from the, the high poly, you can really have to care about the shading of the models and keeping the, the smoothing groups. Uh, smoothing groups uh, in correct places because you know the, the normal map corresponds to uh, to, to the smoothing of your model. Also, it's really important to keep the silhouette of the model. So do not try to simplify everything and do not flatten everything. Um, also, you, can, you, you have to really care about the distance of your LODs. So I, I would probably suggest to, to test the distances, like, I don't know, is it visible from 10, 15, 15 or 20 meters? And probably, uh, probably that said, also, I would pay attention to uh, amount of vertices. Every time you make the hard edge, it's pretty much double up your, your vertices in the engine. So keep everything simple, especially on, on UVs. Uh, try to use as less uh, hard edges as possible. Thank you. I have a question here from Alistair. Aside from the texture flats, so you know you were displaying your uh, normal, your diffuse, etc., alongside your model. Uh, what other way, or what is the best way to render your textures in a portfolio and present them? I think um, 
you know, it's it's quite it's trending uh, technique of presenting your your textures, especially from substance designer, is to create like small scene, uh, like you can apply uh, apply your textures to uh, to the flat plane, displace it, maybe add nice lighting, some particles, you know, make it make it quite interesting. Uh, you know, I, I show you some examples with uh, the the British wall I, I created. You know, so you can make a small animation, you can make a small show reel, uh, you can animate the texture if if you know how to in Substance Designer to make it more interesting. And also a part of you know presenting uh, your your texture as animation or video or something like that, you can also include the the sphere with the with the texture. You can also include the the texture that tells more than one to show that there's no visible visible patterns, which is uh, which is quite difficult to mask out. So probably something like that. And also include the textures itself. It doesn't have to be like the whole texture. You can just you know split it into albedo, roughness, metalness, and show it as a as a one piece. Very nice, thank you. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have a name for this one, but uh, what farming simulator did you work on? Uh, to be fair, I don't remember. As I as I said, I work as an outsourcer, so they just uh, they just sent us the uh, the references that we had to follow. But I believe it was like one of the of the oldest, like maybe 2015 or 16. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure there's no my name in the credits, as you know, when you work as an outsourcer, you have to just sell the copyrights. Uh, the, the rights for your artwork, and usually you don't mention the the companies uh, that were outsourced for the project. Um, at least it happened in this case. But yeah, um, probably like 2015, I would say that was the time you know Substance Painter wasn't a thing, and we had to do all the textures in Photoshop. So I believe it was like 2015, 16. Okay, sure, thank you. I understand that you're under a lot of NDAs, non-disclosure acts. Um, so Kyle Lander asks, is there any new games that you're working on now? I cannot answer that, unfortunately. Okay, good, as much. Thanks for <laughs> check. All right, I've got a, a Nan Nancha Howell asking, how has the pandemic affected uh, your work? Uh, do you have any advice for uh, working in these unusual times? So I remember when they announced uh, the you know home office thing, and when we moved, and we moved quite early, like before the whole thing, probably in Poland. Uh, I think two or three months were like super difficult because I had to reschedule my whole whole routine, and it was quite difficult, you know, quite difficult to do because I used to work in a studio. I really miss working with people. Uh, so my advice would be probably, you know, talk, talk as much as possible to the people, you know, call them, um, if it's possible, go for a walk, you know, and um, it will give you the same experience as working as a, as a freelancer, pretty much, when you work from your home and you have to organize your own time. So pretty much your own boss, you know, and you have to, um, you have to be very strict with yourself. So you wake up, you brush your teeth, have a breakfast, go to your work for eight hours and, and that's it. So you have to just reschedule your whole day, daily routine. Okay, that's good advice there. Uh, Joe Jolliffe asks, how important would you say it is to have good topology? Let's say, for example, you have an asset that doesn't have the best topology, but it looks good in the engine. Should I put this in my portfolio? Uh, I would suggest not to put that into portfolio because you know some uh, some recruiters, some companies, they really pay attention to the topology. It's really important, especially in the big projects like I don't know Cyberpunk, uh, that you have clean topology, that all your models are optimized. So of course you can make really outstanding model and put like millions of of um, polygons. But uh, in the games, it's about to keep everything optimized and get the same look as, as for example, your high poly or sculpture, you know, be, be tricky about it. So probably I will focus, focus on creating really clean topology first, good edge flow, um, you know, showing the, the optimizing techniques like making the LODs or uh, baking some floating geometry or 
using some decal sheets, you know, it will definitely be beneficial for you as an artist because you want to know how to make these optimized models uh, with really, you know, restricted uh, budgets in the future because every, every, uh, every studio have their own budgets uh, and you have to just follow them. So if you, if you publish, um, you know, really outstanding work but with bad, bad topology, they, they won't care about you because they're looking for someone that they could, uh, who can make um, good quality models with as, uh, as less triangles as possible. Yes, I see. Um, that does make sense. A uh, question from Josiah Holt. How would you go about turning a 2D concept into a 3D model? So it's it's mostly about the silhouettes. So you have to follow the, the silhouettes. Sometimes it's really worth when you're working with 3D model to apply a black material, uh, like unlit material. So it, it can just show off just the silhouette of the model and try to try to follow it, you know, work with simple shapes there, block it out. If it's something stylized, you have to exaggerate some, <clears throat> sorry, exaggerate some proportions and, and shapes. And once you're happy with the silhouette, you can go into details and, you know, add some, um, I don't know, metal details or uh, some cloth variation and folds. I see. Okay, thank you. A question from Reese Ward. If you were to create an environment to tell a story for a game about the world and its themes, how would you do it? How would you make it a work of art? So probably a good point is uh, to include some maybe posters. Depends what, what genre you're going for. In my case, like when I created Max Payne, I tried to you know add as much as much uh, Easter eggs as possible. So maybe some logo of Valka truck, or maybe a map of um, map of the whole metro station. So all these things build the, the, the story about the environment. You can you can create as many decals as, as possible maybe some graffiti um i don't know some blood stains and, and uh, you know playing with lighting all these stuff matters okay thank you very much um i think that brings us to the end of my question oh one more avoid check give me a moment one more okay okay so another one from reese if you were to build a large project to take up most of your time, would having a strategy of building an environment and presenting props and pieces in a portfolio to show expertise be a good tactic so that you have an arsenal of assets to use in later projects to build an asset library with? Oh yeah, definitely. That's pretty much what I did with my environment. So once I published the, the whole environment, uh, I could also present like simple props, uh, sim uh, single props I, I created for this particular environment. So it's definitely worth it. Depends on the quality of the of the props. You know, sometimes it's not worth it to show them if they were like just a background props. But uh, if you have some hero props from the environment, that's definitely worth to give a shot and, and publish it as a standalone piece. Excellent. Uh, I think that brings us to the end of our questions. Uh, I'm just gonna leave it open for another 20 seconds. If anybody have, has any questions, please send them through now so we can uh, ask Wojciech himself. Okay, so here's one from Chris Walton. How do you cope with the issue that affects everyone? Imposter syndrome. Um, I know you're culprit of this, me too. How do you know that your work is good enough? Well, I never know is my, is my work good enough. Usually I have to, to ask people. And you know, even if I'm confident about my own skills, it's really hard to be super satisfied. Sometimes, you know, I publish something and 10 minutes ago, I find out like many mistakes that I made and stuff to, to, to polish. So uh, probably if, if you're like real artist, you will never be satisfied with your own work. And it's a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. A good thing about this, uh, you know, you always push, push yourself and push your limits to do something do something more, do something better. However, 
it also might be a bit toxic, you know, because uh, you need to be satisfied with what you're doing. Obviously, I'm satisfied with the projects I worked on. I'm satisfied with my portfolio, but there's always but. But you can always do something better. So, um, you know, uh, I, I'm just living with that. You know, I'm just I'm just trying to do my thing, and eventually one day maybe I'll sit in my archer with Earl Grey and tell that hey, I did a good thing. Uh, but not probably not yet. Probably not yet. I still need some time. You know, I still need to be a bit better. You know, I always want to push myself to do better things. Sure, sure. Uh, Liam Hayes asks. Um, we know that you used to get reference from Pinterest and stuff, but did you actually go around yourself pre-COVID and actually gain reference for yourself? Trips to Harry Potter World, trips down the street to bring with your camera, anything like that. Mm, yes, we had a trip to Harry Potter Studio on, on university. We we took some. We I took a lot of pictures. However, um, you know, um, I'm pretty sure I used more the Pinterest and and Google references rather than Harry Potter Studio. Now I believe like that was a mistake because you know there was a lot of cool things uh, in Harry Potter Studio words, especially like Victorian buildings, like a lot of props that you can use. For example, now I'm working on Golden Snitch and Substance Designer, and it's extremely hard to find the references like the of the of the prop that they they use in the in the movie. And I have to, you know, be tricky about it and try to make some screenshots from the movies instead of like having a picture from Harry Potter Studio World because I, I was there, you know, but I never thought that in a couple of years I would try to try to recreate uh, stuff. So, uh, you know, you can you can take as many pictures as, as possible. For example, the uh, substance designer uh, role I, I showed you. Basically, I passed uh, passed that wall every day I went to the studio when I lived in UK. So one day I was like, hmm, what if I would just uh, make some uh, make some pictures, make some photos and try to recreate it in, in Substance Designer. So, you know, the inspiration is every day. And once you will do the models every day on your daily basis, you won't see the pavement. Uh, you will see the substance designer uh, texture. You won't see the, the lamp. You will see the topology of it. So everything is like inspiration for you, even some industrial uh, industrial elements uh, around you. Excellent. And I do know we're getting a lot more questions in, but unfortunately, we are uh, down to the last minute. So final question for you. Would you be happy with us connecting to you on LinkedIn? Yeah, that's fine. You can you can find me on LinkedIn. You can you can follow me on ArtStation. And if you have any questions or ask for the feedback, or if you want to to have the mentorship, uh, I'm, I'm definitely open for that. Uh, I hope that I won't get thousands of, of messages every day. But uh, if if I have like some spare time, I'm open for for your messages. And feel free to to add me add me on LinkedIn. Well. Uh, Wojciech, thank you so much for coming, joining us here today um, and delivering your incredibly valuable insight and answering to you know, all of those excellent questions. So thank you, Wojciech. Um, and I'd love for you to just stay uh, with me while we get everybody to leave and uh, we can have a quick chat afterwards.